Breath is life. Life is absolutely dependent upon the act of breathing. Breath is life. Differ as they may upon details of theory and terminology, the Oriental and Occidental agree upon these fundamental principles. To breathe is to live, and without breath there is no life. Not only are the higher animals dependent upon breath for life and health, but even the lower forms of animal life must breathe to live, and plant life is likewise dependent upon the air for continued existence. The infant draws in a long, deep breath retains it for a moment to extract from its life-giving properties, and then exhales it in a long wail, and lo, its life upon earth has begun. The old man gives a faint gasp, ceases to breathe, and life is over. From the first faint breath of the infant to the last gasp of the dying man, it is one long story of continued breathing. Life is but a series of breaths. Breathing may be considered the most important of all the functions of the body, for indeed, all the other functions depend upon it. Man may exist some time without eating, a shorter time without drinking, but without breathing, his existence may be measured by a few minutes. And not only is man dependent upon breath for life, but he is largely dependent upon correct habits of breathing for continued vitality and freedom from disease. An intelligent control of our breathing power will lengthen our days upon earth by giving us increased vitality and powers of resistance, and on the other hand, unintelligent and careless breathing will tend to shorten our days by decreasing our vitality and laying us open to disease. Man in his normal state had no need of instruction in breathing. Like the lower animal and the child, he breathed naturally and properly, as nature intended him to do. But civilization has changed him in this and other respects. He has contracted improper methods and attitudes of walking, standing, and sitting which have robbed him of his birthright of natural and correct breathing. He has paid a high price for civilization. The savage today breathes naturally, unless he has been contaminated by the habits of civilized man. The percentage of civilized men who breathe correctly is quite small, and the result is shown in contracted chest and stooping shoulders, and the terrible increase in diseases of the respiratory organs, including that dread monster, consumption, the white scourge. Eminent authorities have stated that one generation of correct breathers would regenerate the race, and disease would be so rare as to be looked upon as a curiosity. Whether looked at from the standpoint of the Oriental or Occidental, the connection between correct breathing and health is readily seen and explained. The Occidental teachings show that the physical health depends very materially upon correct breathing. The Oriental teachers not only admit that their Occidental brothers are right, but say that in addition to the physical benefit derived from correct habits of breathing, man's mental power, happiness, self-control, clear-sightedness, morals, and even his spiritual growth may be increased by an understanding of the science of breath. Whole schools of Oriental philosophy have been founded upon this science, and this knowledge when grasped by the Western races and by them put to the practical use which is their strong point, will work wonders among them. The theory of the East wedded to the practice of the West, will produce worthy offspring. This work will take up the yogi science of breath, which includes not only all that is known to the Western physiologist and hygienist, but the occult side of the subject as well. It not only points out the way to physical health along the lines of what Western scientists have termed deep breathing, etc., but also goes into the less known phases of the subject and shows how the Hindu yogi controls his body increasing his mental capacity, and develops the spiritual side of his nature by the science of breath. The yogi practices exercises by which he attains control of his body, and is enabled to send to any organ or part an increased flow of vital force, or prana, thereby strengthening and invigorating the part or organ. He knows all that his western scientific brother knows about the physiological effect of correct breathing, but he also knows that the air contains more than oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen, and that something more is accomplished than the mere oxygenating of the blood. He knows something about prana, of which his western brother is ignorant, and he is fully aware of the nature and manner of handling that great principle of energy, and is fully informed as to its effect upon the human body and mind. He knows that by rhythmical breathing, one may bring himself into harmonious vibration with nature, and aid in the unfoldment of his latent powers. 
He knows that by controlled breathing, he may not only cure disease in himself and others, but also practically do away with fear and worry and the baser emotions. To teach these things is the object of this work. We will give in a few chapters concise explanations and instructions, which might be extended into volume. We hope to awaken the minds of the Western world to the value of the yogi science of breath. End of chapter 2